ask God to convict us and exhort us through his truth. Father, we come humbly to your throne asking that the spirit who inspired scripture would work mightily through your word to convict us of indwelling sin, to exhort us in how we walk more consistently in righteousness, revive our hearts, restore to us the wonder and joy of our salvation. Lord, as we go to the psalmist to be tutored by him, might this work into the fabric of our lives as you would convict us of uh, rebellious wills, that you would uh, uh, stir our affections, you would inform our intellect. All for the praise of our God we ask it. Amen. On July 8th, 1734, Jonathan Edwards stepped into the pulpit to preach his now famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards had actually preached from the same text several times previously, as recently as one month earlier to his own congregation in Northampton, Massachusetts. But while the guest preacher in Enfield, Connecticut, he preached this sermon yet again, and the people in that New England church were deeply affected. Eliezer Wheelock, one of the leading preachers of the Great Awakening, said the people were, quote, bowed down with an awful conviction of the sin and danger. One man under deep conviction sprang up and cried, Mr. Edwards, have mercy. Others caught hold of the backs of the pews lest they should slip into the pit of hell. Many thought that the day of judgment had suddenly dawned upon them. And still others were alarmed that God, while blessing others, should in anger simply pass them by. Revival had come to New England. Oh, that God would do it again. You know, I spent so many years of my life there. Restoring his work among his people in colonial America, he empowered them to do his will. You might ask the question, well, what is revival? Literally, the word itself means a restoring back to the fullness of life, that which has become stagnant or dormant. It's a rekindling of spiritual life in individual believers and churches that have fallen into rather sluggish times. True revival always returns God's people to a fresh and vivid emphasis on the holiness and the righteousness of God, His judgment upon sin, true repentance, and the overflowing effect of personal conversions to Christ. Like I said in regards to the bulletin insert, Revival begins in the church, not outside the church. It's a supernatural work of God in which he visits his people, restoring spiritual life to their hearts as well as ushering salvation into many souls. Such a work is always a sovereign work of God that cannot be duplicated by man. And it is in response to the prayers of his people and leaves a lasting mark on his work forever. You know, as we seek to be more diligent in praying for restoration or revival, we're going to visit with the psalmist in his same prayer. That's the central theme of Psalm 85, a prayer offered in difficult days for the reviving of God's people in days of spiritual apathy. Although the historical setting of this psalm can't be firmly established, it's believed to be the time soon after ancient Israel returned to her land in Palestine after 70 years of captivity in Babylon as chastening for her sin. In 538 B.C., under the leadership of Zerubbabel, the first Jews returned to Jerusalem. Then 558 B.C., a group under Ezra returned. And at first, the people rejoiced at being able to return to their homeland. But once the, the building project came to a standstill, the holy city fell into difficult times. 
if this is the actual setting for Psalm 85, then it is a prayer that God would revive their work, restore the city to its former glory. Accordingly, the answer to this prayer came in 445 B.C., with the arrival of Nehemiah, who did in fact restore God's work in a time of spiritual revival. So here's a psalm intended to inspire God's people with the prospects of a bright tomorrow whenever his work comes to a standstill. Why is it that Christians are commanded to pray? Well, working from the Reformation principle that God alone can do the work of God, it was that great revivalist, Jonathan Edwards, who said, God has been pleased to constitute prayer to be antecedent to the bestowment of mercy. And he is blessed to bestow mercy in consequence of prayer as though he were prevailed upon by prayer, unquote. Stephen Nichols says, in other words, God ordains the end or the results, and He also ordains the means. And what are the means to that restoration and revival? It's the prayers of the saints. Prayer is God-ordained means to carry out His will. And although this humbles us, God ordains the means of the prayers of His people and the carrying out of His will. We don't pray to change God's mind. We pray so that we could be used of Him. And our exposition today is this prayer of restoration in Psalm 85 as we too pray for revival in our own, in our own day and age. Notice, uh, we'll read the psalm in just a moment, but to just orient our thoughts, outline in the uh, the psalm, he, he first of all remembers redemption. Then he requests restoration and reveals righteousness. Out of this bleak situation, the psalm leads to a, a point at which a gloriously fertile stretch of country comes into view. You know, this, uh, we got to kind of put our Jewish sandals on to see that their, their idea of prosperity and peace and blessing and tranquility is when the, the rains came and the, you know, when, when the psalmist talks about the, the righteous man being like a transplanted tree by rivers of water, the, the lush greenness that returns with the rains. You see Yahweh's righteousness his steadfast love, his salvation, his glory, and his peace. These are divine attributes that dominate the psalm. I trust that you daily meditate on at least one of those attributes to keep your eyes of faith set on him, not on the wickedness and the hostility, even the humdrum of life today. You know, this is not a pining for the good old days but a fervent prayer that God's people would continue to experience His presence and blessing rather than settle for the status quo, life as it is, just passing through or in a survival mode, that God would revive our hearts. Remember Jesus promised blessing that the truly happy life is to Him who thirsts for righteousness, hungers and thirsts for it. The psalmist's prayer here evidences such a hunger and a thirst. Would you follow along as I read for us? Psalm 85, beginning in verse 1. O Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the captivity of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your fury. You turned away from your burning anger. So whether you go back to the historical records of Scripture... You can always see the goodness of God in redemption, whether it be the Exodus or even in your own history when God may have had to rattle your cage quite a lot to bring you to the end of yourself, to the foot of the cross, to cry out for salvation. He's reflecting upon that past glory. What about the present? Verse 4, restore us, O God of our salvation. Cause your indignation toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? 
Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not yourself revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Loving kindness and truth have met each other. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Indeed, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its produce. Righteousness will go before him and will make his footsteps into a way. He ends this psalm in such hopefulness of God's good and kind deliverance through the humble petitions of his people. So, beloved, learn the psalmist three advancing perspectives on revival in Psalm 85, which show his confidence in its arrival. Your outline's on the back of the bulletin as usual. We want, first of all, to see the reflection of God's past mercies in verses 1 to 3. A reflection of God's past mercies. So from the perspective of past history, he recalls the precedent of revival. God is still at work, even while wickedness is at work. This is the second of four Korahite Psalms in book three of the Psalter. We don't know assuredly the historical backdrop, but if it is the period of rebuilding after the Babylonian exile, which it appears to be, Nehemiah 1.3 describes her situation, where he says the remnant there is the province of who survived the captivity and they're in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire, just waiting for the enemy marauders to come through. Desolation and doom. Are we not reminded by the psalmist that the, the place to start to overcome discouragements is by reflecting on the goodness of God toward us in, pa- in the past? He doesn't change. The same good God of history that we just sang about is the God of today and the God of our futures. And so with this reflection on God's past mercies, there is a precedent involving divine restoration in verse 1. A precedent involving divine restoration. Verse 1, he looks back to a scene very different from what they were experiencing on that present day. To show favor is more than being kind. It speaks of deeming someone or something acceptable. And this favor, that, that term favor is used often in context of atonement. Because their restoration was not only physically relocating them back to their land. Because... The gates are burned with fire. It didn't look real great in Palestine on that day. It's a spiritual restoration. It's a precedent involving divine restoration. It's a precedent, second of all, involving divine reconciliation. Because verses 2 and 3 give the context and unpack verse 1 a bit further. This salvation, though there was a physical salvation, leaving Babylon, going back to their homeland, it was a spiritual one because their soul, the soul issues going on. It's had troubles. My life is drawn near to Sheol at times. You know, when God restores his people and forgives their iniquity, he covers their sin and withdraws his fury. That is more than a physical component to this favor. You know, America prays for the favor of God, but America is not a Christian nation. keeps on raising its rebellious fist in God's face. 
when he talks about their iniquity in verse 2, that's translation of the Hebrew term awan, meaning corrupt and twisted, bent, perverse, crooked. It reflects on man's self-defiant. Man at his core is twisted. He's still an image bearer of God, but that image has been tainted by sin, by his iniquity. A self-corrupting and twisting of his own character, a bending of integrity. See, it's a matter of man's guilt. Israel was rightfully in bondage. When David sinned as the king of the nation, he became, he became unclean and dirty. When you go to Psalm 51 and verse 2, he prays to God when he's finally going to own his sin and seek restoration and reviving of his sinful heart. He says, wash away my iniquity, my twistedness of character. Cleanse me. He pleads in Psalm 51.10, create in me a purity of heart, not this iniquity of heart, that, which is so innate in us. He exclaims in Psalm 32.1, how blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin has been covered. You know, when he looks back, the, the, the Korahites are, are putting this song and this prayer together, looking back at the favor of God, not just bringing them back to their land, but how he has covered their sin and forgiven them. When God forgave the iniquity of His people, verse 2, forgiveness is that Hebrew verb, nasa, meaning to raise, to lift up, to bear, to carry, or to take away. God took away the sins of His people as He made them saints. This is something man can't do for himself. Man cannot save himself. God is the only one who can lift up or forgive. He rolls man's sin off him when he confesses it. I think one of the greatest definitions I ever heard in theology class of forgiveness is that it's a promise of pardon. When the writers of Scripture tell us that God takes our sin and carries it up from us and removes it as far as the east is from the west, and that he remembers it no more. It's not that God's got a bad memory. This is an act of his sovereign will not to hold the sins against his people that they confess and that's been atoned for. He has promised we simply receive by faith, even when we're capturing our thoughts. You know, we, we confess our sin, we repent, and sometimes it's hard getting up to breathe that gospel fresh air of living in our forgiven status. And that's what obedience does, though. It is a promise of pardon. We simply receive it through eyes of faith. And you notice what is out to the margin of your Bible in this first history lesson. Say, a lot of people think it's a, a musical notation to stop, to pause and meditate on those truths that have just been rehearsed. Man's greatest need has been met, but only those who cry out in repentant faith have it applied to their personal account and they reflect upon the goodness of God in His salvation. You know, when they are praying and begging God, you know, to withdraw his fury that they were presently experiencing. Why was Palestine decimated? It's because their sin. They needed to own it. God is this great turner and remover and forgiver and pardoner of sin. Back in Psalm 78 and verse 38 this similar reflection that he, being 
compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them, and often he restrained his anger and did not arouse all his wrath. When God sent his prophet Jonah to these wicked Ninevites and said, several days hence, God's going to destroy you. And why did the Jewish prophet not want to go there? Because he knows that God is a forgiver, that he's compassionate. And in his anger, he's sitting outside the city, waiting for God to burn them all up. And because they repent of their sin, God relents of that uh, danger that he promised. James Montgomery Boyce, faithful pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philly for years, talks about how we, little we value forgiveness and God pardoning our sin and just take it for granted. He said, if God gives us good health, a, a happy and supportive family, a good job and praise from our employer and friends, we think that we are blessed. If we lack any one of these things, we begin to suppose that God has somehow forgotten us or does not care. We do not think how blessed we are to have our sins forgiven and to be delivered from the judicial wrath of God through the atoning death of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the strongest salvation language in Scripture is present in these first three verses of the psalm where they reflect upon how God forgave the iniquity of His people. He covered all their sin. He withdrew His fury and He turned away from His burning anger. And they're begging God to do it again. Your know, knowledge and remembrance of God's mercies displayed in our previous years breeds confidence in the present. What brings us hope? That God doesn't change. As wicked and sinful as we still are as sinning saints that are righteous but still committing sins, that He pardons, He forgives, and that brings us hope to live for Him today. As you get into verses 4 to 7, there is the recognition of God's present anger. So from the perspective of present history, not past history, but present history, he responds with prayers for revival. Notice the request. Restore us, O God of our salvation. Cause your indignation toward us to cease. He opens his prayers with specific requests in verse 4. He addresses God of our salvation. He'll do it again in verse 7. He'll do it yet again in verse 9, which is an inclusio. It brackets this section and refers to deliverance and rescue and victory and help or liberty. While surrounded by enemies and the, the gates of the city are burned down and they're surrounded, This first use could very well be physical deliverance that they're asking for, a physical salvation. Because many times in Scripture, whether you're in Numbers or Exodus or Judges, Psalms or Jeremiah, this term salvation is used in a physical sense. And there's a lot of physical issues of life that we need to be saved from, do we not? And so we pray, just like they did. But later in this same psalm, it clearly has redemptive meaning, just like it does elsewhere in Scripture. His third repetition helps to emphasize the salvific, the redemptive message of this psalm. I, I said it's again in verse 7. Look at it. Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant to us your salvation. And so it's, since it's looking to a, a spiritual loving kindness the covenant love of God, it is a spiritual salvation that they are also begging God for. Down in verse 9, surely His salvation is near to those who fear Him, God-fearers. So that though there may be that 
physical element, there is definitely this spiritual salvation they're asking for. He asked God even to cease his indignation. Now, we understand that the wrath of God hovers over those that haven't come to him in saving faith. It abides on them. That he's always angry with the wicked every day, as we're told. But he's also angry with his rebellious children, which we'll look at in Hosea when we start studying that book uh, pretty soon. But this indicates their present crisis. It's due to their sin. He's angry because of the sins of the saints. This ceasing or abandoning or turning that is talked about is used variously throughout the psalm to give a lot of color as he's leading the people and asking God for restoration and for a turning, turning us, turning back to his people who had spurned his law. So turning his people's heart to him and himself towards them. It's a very versatile word. Pleading with God to turn from his wrath. Turn your people from their rebellion, which elicits that wrath. Restoration and revival is what they needed. It's what we need when we've lost the joy of our salvation. Fortunately, great, God's the great restorer, is He not? He can restore what apart from Him could never be made good. We make a good mess of things and only God can bring beauty out of ashes. So He opens His prayers with specific requests in verse 4. And in verses 5 and 6, He supplements His prayers with pointed questions. Notice them. They're rhetorical. The first questions understand a negative response, and the latter, in verse 6, more of a positive answer. Notice them again. Will you be angry with us forever? The assumed answer is no, because God's a compassionate God and willing to forgive. Will you prolong your anger to all generations? The rhetorical answer is, of course not. Will you not yourself revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Of course. As we said from this pulpit before, God is more willing to forgive sinners than sinners are to repent of their sin. He welcomes into his arms those who turn from their sin and embrace him through faith. And the way that the Hebrews arranged here focuses not so much on the forever and the all generations, but on the anger repeated with each question. Will you? Will you? And notice what he does here in that verse 6. Will you not yourself, capitalize Y, pointing to the only one who can revive his people. No human being can work it up from within him. No human being can manipulate it to happen to others. It's a sovereign gift by a good and gracious God that we just sang in our chorus. Verse 6 is that plea for spiritual awakening of God's people. That God would restore their hearts with renewed devotion toward Him because that same heart that is red on fire the moment of our conversion gets cold if we're not very careful. If God would revive them, they'd rejoice again. But truth be told, there can be no true rejoicing without spiritual revival. He opens with specific requests in verse 4. Supplements with those pointed questions in verses 5 and 6. And then he closes his prayers with general requests. Notice verse 7. Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Loving kindness is Hesed, his, his faithful love. Give us salvation. So there's the revive of Verse 6, the salvation of verse 7. 
These petitions dare to not only invoke God's covenant, His steadfast love, that He doesn't renege on His promises, He doesn't turn from His people, but His delight in salvation. While we have to recognize God's anger, He's driven to God's creative work of bringing life out of death and joy out of gloom. Old Testament commentator Kidner notes, quote, judgment by contrast is his strange and alien work in which he takes no pleasure. God is not over the top to judge like he is over the top to save. There is judgment, yes. They were experiencing the anger of God but they're pleading that he would cause them to turn, to repent. You know, I think one of the great Old Testament illustrations before we move on to our third and final point is found in the minor prophet Joel. In Joel chapter 1, there's probably a, a real locust that came and devastated the land. And again, often physical devastation comes about as punishment for spiritual disobedience. But as you start going through Joel and you get into chapter 2, it's more of an eschatological view of the future. So we can think of the promise in the book of Joel in which God pledges Himself to restore what the locusts have eaten. There has been a, a real devastating locust invasion in Joel's day. And Joel explained it as being God's judgment for his people's sins, as well as a warning of a greater final judgment yet to come, that eschatological judgment that will come. Nevertheless, if the people will repent, Joel 2, 25 and 26 records, I'll repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you. So, who sent the devastation? God did. You'll have plenty to eat, though, until you're full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Again, we're good at messing it up, and God is the master of fixing it all for the praise of His glory. Notice thirdly and finally the, the last section of Psalm verses 8 to 13, the revelation of God's future salvation that even Joel speaks of. This is from the perspective of future history. So they've looked at the past, they've observed the anger of the present under the ha chastening hand of God, and they look to future history as they revel in the prospect of revival. The climax is one of the most satisfying descriptions of conquered, spiritual, moral, material to be found anywhere in Scripture. On all levels, every aspect, every plane of existence, ultimately this promised peace finds fulfillment in the future coming of Messiah's kingdom. Verses 8 to 10, there's prospect of divine peace. Notice it again. The psalmist says he'll speak peace to his people, to his godly ones, but let them not turn back to folly. Let them, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land, loving kindness and truth have met together. That's the prospect. This section begins with this singular, I will hear what the Lord will say. After this collective prayer that's already taken place, the psalmist is speaking in the singular as he reflects upon it. With solo voice, pausing for reflection, listening for God's word, even encouraging the rest to heed it. He speaks for himself as compared to his speaking on behalf of the people in verses 1 to 7. And he reflects upon 
God speaking peace to his people, to his godly ones. These words of peace are not to the rebellious who have not turned to him as Savior and Lord. His godly ones, this is a a word related to that term hesed, his loving kindness. These are his loved ones, the ones he has set his love upon, his loyal ones. This is where Hasidic Jews obtain their names from this very word. That he'll speak peace, shalom, was your typical greeting. And God will do that. It includes the thought of wholeness or well-being, a, a fullness about life. What he speaks, God also creates. You know, consider Isaiah's words in Isaiah 57. In Isaiah 57, verses 18 to 21, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I'll lead him and restore comfort to him and to his mourners, creating the praise of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord. I will heal him, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet. And its waters toss up refuse and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. You know, this... These verses could be a commentary on the verses in the Psalms we're studying. Not the least is the warning of no peace for the wicked in verse 21. The psalmist in solo says, I'll hear what God the Lord will say. For he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. But there's a condition God is all over the forgiveness and the peace that he brings into the life that he changes. But we don't impose upon grace. Grace is no excuse for sin. Don't go back to the old foolish ways. We're tempted to be drawn back to sin. But it's not like those in the world. Surely his salvation, verse 9, is near to those who fear him. A present reality to God-fearing saints. Again, Isaiah says in Isaiah 46, I I bring near my righteousness. God says he's not far off. My salvation will not delay. I will grant salvation. So as we come to verse 10, when God inaugurates this new day, many divine attributes will be revealed. Loving kindness and truth met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. It's a poetic way of describing harmony. A metaphor of the cooperative harmony of both righteousness and peace. That term righteousness, sadiq, means to do right and is used to speak of someone or something that's honest and just and equitable and moral, not someone that's twisted like we saw earlier in the psalm. It's used... In the Pentateuch and throughout many Psalms of judges who judge with impartiality, they're actually, they're doing their job. They're not bought off. They are righteous judges. When it's used between individuals, it refers to ethical and moral conduct. It's right actions in perfect accord with integrity and justice. That's the the thematic word in these final verses. Because God is just, His people are to be just. A righteousness of justice which He will bring to Israel. It needs to be worked out in His people by grace. This peace is a a spiritual and physical well-being, welfare, prosperity. I think I mentioned earlier, it used the word conquered. Vast, unspoiled, and rich with life. Not a state of discord, but one of conquered. Here is that meeting of reconciliation between the righteous justice of the Almighty with His loving and compassionate mercy. We understand that peace is not going to be on the grand scheme 
earthly until the millennial reign of the Prince of Peace, but we pray for it and we bring it about as sinners are reconciled to a holy God. They can experience that peace that passes all human understanding. These are the results of atonement. So that the new covenant, the New Testament believer, saints of our age can reflect upon the work that our Messiah has accomplished that we looked at in the Gospel of Mark. Christ demonstrated righteousness. And what did he do through it? He justified many. Perfect union of righteousness and justice. Both God's justice was satisfied as well as his mercy displayed when Jesus in love bore the wrath of sin that we deserve. The wrath that we deserved. Through his faithfulness, God displayed Jesus as that mercy seat by means of his shed blood. Maybe the practical applications of this could be summed up by Oswald Chambers. He said, it's no use to pray for the old days. Stand square where you're at and make the present better than any past has been. Base all of your relationship to God and go forward, and presently you will find that what is emerging is infinitely better than the past ever was. Can you change a sinful past? Not at all. Change takes place today. That's what Chambers is saying. It is present change as we grow in the fear of the Lord and we unpack the glory of our salvation that verse 9 talks about. Even growing in verse 10's communicable attributes that because God shows loving kindness, his saints are. As he is known by truth, so are his saints. As he is righteous, so are we to be, says Peter. As righteousness and peace have kissed each other. They are not polar opposites. So there's this divine peace in verses 8 to 10. And the prospect of divine productivity. Notice verses 11 and 12. Truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Indeed, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its produce. This is confidence. God's reign extends over heaven and earth everywhere. We've been using Isaiah to illustrate the Psalms. In Isaiah 45, 8, he talks about drip down, O heavens. Let clouds pour down righteousness. That's what the psalmist is reflecting on here. God-given prosperity is symbolized by a fruitful harvest. There's a bounty that uh, that characterizes life in Christ. The prospect of this divine productivity. They are experiencing the anger of God and His chastening hand and they're looking forward to that productivity. Verse 12, the, the Lord will give what is good. Psalm 84, 11, the Lord, is, the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. James tells us that every good gift comes from where? From above. James 1.17. Anything good, it's because God's at work. When the land increases, it's because God has given bounty to his people. What he touches, he changes, he beautifies. That's what's so wrong with a theology that, could, that would say that I can accept Jesus as Savior, but I won't, I won't uh, walk with him as Lord until later on. If God has touched your life, he doesn't leave it the same. You know, he promises to make his footsteps into a way. Divine righteousness is what advances his kingdom. We read in Proverbs that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. One last time for Isaiah to help us gain this perspective in Isaiah 58, verses 8 and 9. Then your light will break out like dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke 
from your midst the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. And he goes on. Nothing unstoppable with God and his saints in blessed communion with him. You know, I think of people who come from hopeless situations in life that has, they've really messed up. Life is chaotic, can't even make decisions, not in fellowship with God, they're petting their sin. But you know, when God changes the life and He brings this peace, this bounty about life, He doesn't just change our eternal home in heaven, but the caliber of life today. What exceedingly great news for those who were were experiencing God's present anger for their own sin. It's rightful what they were going through. The psalmist looked to the past in verses 1 to 3, shares his longing for present experience in verses 4 to 7 while living on the promises of verses 8 to 13 of a beautiful future. You know, we could continue to stew in the bleak reality of the world all around us being stiff-necked and hard-hearted, even when we do ministry with saints who seem to be rather calloused or continuing on with the status quo, or we could be like the psalmist, resilient in hope of what God will do, not dependent on man, but keeping our focus on Him rather than man. It was Psalm 85 that Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of England, was reading. On September 16, 1656, the day before the second meeting of the second parliament of the Protectorate, Cromwell was reading Psalm 85 as he meditated on that psalm. He was greatly inspired regarding the future of England. What this psalm promised He desired for his own beloved nation. Cromwell desperately longed for England to be marked by righteousness and peace. A place where God's abundant blessings were clearly seen. And when Parliament convened, Cromwell addressed the members, expounding these very verses as an expression of his vision for the great island of England. He desired that By their faithfulness to God, righteousness might reign in England, and with it, a happier and more harmonious age of peace might come to the land. What Cromwell longed for England, a day when righteousness and peace would meet and kiss, so believers today should pray for as well. We ought to intercede. We ought to petition God for such a time of revival in our own lives and ministries and churches because it can't just be the great time of the Reformation or the great awakening times or during Ezra and Nehemiah's day. Spiritual awakening is the need of every believer in every generation. This present hour is no different. We've said that only God can send such a time of spiritual restoration and renewal of His people, and that's why we pray, as did the psalmist, that God in His grace would revive us again. Might we as God's people pray this psalm afresh in these days and ask God to stir the hearts of His people again. Like I said, whether it's in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament, the Reformation, the Puritan Age, the Great Awakening, revivals have always demonstrated the same qualities. Let me just mention them to you, then we'll pray and sing and go our way the rest of this Lord's Day. A quality that has always punctuated revival has been the proclamation of Scripture. There is no revival without the Word of God. There's been a dramatic return to the Word of God in every scriptural or extra-biblical revival that's taken place. It was true in the revival at the Watergate under Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah 8.8. The centrality of Scripture is undisputable. The Word did it all in the Reformation. And in the early church, 
We'll be reading soon in Acts 2 that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's why the gospel went forth with such force. There's, number one, the proclamation of Scripture. Number two, there's the intercession with God. Genuine spiritual awakening is marked by God's people humbling themselves and seeking the Lord in unceasing prayer. Let Grace Bible Church be a praying church. Might the individual members be a praying people. General spiritual awakening is marked by God's people humbling themselves, seeking him in unceasing prayer, seeking his face, asking him to revive his people and restore his work. We'll say it one more time. God sovereignly orchestrates revival, but prayer has always been the forerunner, and that's our responsibility. Proclamation of Scripture prayers of intercession. Thirdly, confession of sin. True revival ushers in a deep conviction of personal sin, a confessing of that sin and a turning away, lest we boast in the grace that got us out of that sin in the first place and go back to the pig slop of our sin. Iniquities are revealed by the word. Hearts are broken by deep contrition. Sin is put away. It happened in Ezra's day as people confessed their sin to God while openly grieving that they departed from God's standard. In fact, they, they put on sackcloth and ashes. They threw dust on their heads. They acknowledged their sin, bringing it into the open before God. Vance Habner, commenting on counterfeit revivals, said many a so-called revival is only a drive for Church members, which adds more unsaved sinners, starched and ironed, but not washed to a fellowship where even the true believers haven't been aroused for years. Jonathan Edwards, the theologian of revival, confessed, I have had a vastly greater sense of my own wickedness and the badness of my heart than ever I had before my conversion. And it takes a final and fourth quality, a devotion to holiness. Old paths of holiness and obedience, previously forsaken, are once more pursued. The word is not only taught and heard, but received and kept in obedience. Putting it into practice with a new resolve. A renewed commitment to return to scripture and obey it. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we come into your holy presence because of the shed blood of Jesus that not only forgave our sins, but allowed us audience with the king of all earthly kings, we want to thank you for covering our sin and forgiving our many iniquities. Father, would you prevent us from causing displeasure? Might we fear the displeasure of God? rather than our own pleasure or the pleasure and the accolades and the applause of mortal man. Might we fear you above all. Might we rejoice in you. A soberness that would characterize our lives over our sin, but also this joyfulness of being pardoned. Cause us always to rejoice in you. Show Grace Bible Church and our families your loyal love day in and day out. That the God of history is the God of this present history and the God of the future. And you specialize in producing beauty out of ashes. And Lord, don't let us go back to our folly, our emptiness. Use us to advance your fame as you grow us more in the image of our Savior, in whose name we ask it. Amen. Now we take a big... Um, chance by hoping that you remember an old hymn, Revive Us Again. Would you stand as we have our song of benediction? May this be the prayer of our hearts.
Hey, Sharon, did you know there notice the veggies? Did you want any of the veggies? Mike just brought those in from his garden. There's some summer squash and some uh, zucchinis. Yeah? Yep. Did you? So they're, they're right there. And there's some extra bags as well. So 